All right, thanks for joining us. I believe we are live now um, out front of my Union West Virginia office. Hopefully I've got the the technology set up. Just let me know in a comment if you can't hear. Um, again, I'm um, attorney John Bryan, and we're here in the lovely town of Union, West Virginia, sitting in front of my office. All right. And then sitting here with me is Marshall Wilson. And uh, we have some um, visitors already. And basically, we wanted to do just sort of a town hall style meet and greet discussion, debate, whatever, so that people can get to know uh, Marshall. So we've got one microphone and one camera, but you know, we'll try to make it work. So what we're going to do is, if you have any questions online, if you're following online, just make a comment, and then I'll put the comment up on the screen, and I'll repeat it to Marshall, and we... Uh, We'll see if he'll, you know, he can get your answer, uh, question answered, and and have a good discussion here. So maybe I'll I'll uh, kind of start off with with uh, my little spiel here. You know, I first met Marshall Wilson when he invited me to the Capitol to discuss filing a lawsuit against the West Virginia Governor Jim Justice because of the executive orders that he had entered that closed small businesses around West Virginia, that closed the schools, that have, I think, will prove to have been way more devastating to the people of West Virginia than COVID-19 ever could have been. And I think last night at the debates, if you watched the debates, you saw the stark contrast between our state, how the way it went and the direction it could have gone. I hope you saw the commercial that the governor of South Dakota, Kristi Noem, played during one of the commercial breaks at the presidential debate. And it just, it blew me away with the stark contrast between what West Virginia should have done during this crisis and what we did do. But if you haven't seen it, watch the video just Google and uh, just go to YouTube and search for Christy Nome ad, South Dakota, something like that, and you'll see it. So one of the best, uh, it's not really a political ad. It is an advertisement for the people and the small businesses of South Dakota. Oh, we don't. Hello. And it's, it, it was, that's what, honestly, we do have more beauty here in West Virginia than they have in South Dakota. A lot of South Dakota is <laughs> ugly. But they have Governor Christy Nome. What a wonderful, wonderful governor. What a wonderful woman. When she's out there roping cows and, and, and riding with the buffalo. I mean, it, she makes a point that they respect their citizens, they trust their citizens, they value their citizens, and they let them make their own choices. They give them freedom. And yet they, they have great results with it. And here in West Virginia, we still have our governor on TV or on his live stream, which is basically a free taxpayer funded campaign ad daily although i'm not sure what good it really does I mean, if you look at the comment section it really is i think i saw more vote marshall wilson comments today than than actual any other type of comment towards jim justice i mean it's just it's just sad who we ended up with in west virginia compared to who we could have had and that is someone like christy no but Going back to Marshall Wilson, you know, from the moment I first met him, I, I, there was no doubt in my mind that this is somebody who values the Constitution, who values in, individual freedom, and is willing to fight for it. And learning his history, is, it's impressive as well, because he has fought for freedom. He's commanded troops and, and more as an officer in the Army. He's gone to the deepest, darkest areas of the South American jungle, and I'm not even exaggerating, to teach people who have never seen a book before in their lives about God, about Jesus. This is somebody who has nine children 
Not real all, sure how that happened. All of whom really love him. I can tell you that. And that's not easy to do as a parent of even two kids in, in my experience. So that says a lot about him. So I've been really impressed with him. And I think not only can we have Christy Nome, but we can have Marshall Wilson. And, you know, you they say you get the gover- government that you deserve. And that's really a governor right now because we're, we've been ruled by a governor for seven months. But if, if West Virginia gets the government that we deserve, we deserve something better. Right now, in this upcoming election, you have a choice between Jim Justice, who was elected originally as a Democrat, and the real Democrat, who is a trial lawyer who wants to take us backwards. The only other choice that, that, that we really have here is Marshall Wilson. And he's not on the ballot because you, you have to get, what, how many signatures? 7,200. 7,200 signatures. I mean, real signatures per individual county of actual registered voters in that county. And there was a huge grassroots effort, even though there was very little time and there was a lockdown order in place. I mean, his supporters were still able to, to almost ma- meet that mark. How many signatures did we 5, get? 5,710. So we got 5,710 signatures of registered voters across the state of West Virginia during a, a lockdown where groups of 25 people weren't even allowed to meet. And people were so scared that they they weren't didn't want to come outside of their homes or talk to people. So it was still an impressive collection of signatures, but there's still hope it's not over because we we have the right to write in a candidate. And Marshall Wilson is still on the ballot as a write-in candidate. And there have been elections that are won by write-in candidates who have grassroots popular support. I believe, was it Lisa Murkowski, I think, yes. won one of her elections as a write-in candidate. So don't say it can't be done. Anything can be done. I don't think anybody supports this governor. They just support the party name that he's attached himself to. So I want you to meet Marshall Wilson if you haven't already. And so we've got him here in front of front of the office here. And uh, anybody who has a question is invited to ask it. If you have a question, put it up on on the comments and, and we'll, we'll get to all the questions. But let me go ahead and hand it over to, to Marshall to introduce himself to you. And again, Marshall, thanks for coming. Thank you, John. I'm really humbled by your kind words. Uh, I, uh, I'll try really hard to live up to them. I, uh, as John said, I'm a, I'm a retired U.S. Army infantry officer. I was a combat veteran. I'm a combat veteran. was an infantry officer. I commanded 130 men in combat. I was a missionary in the Amazon jungle. Um, I taught systematic theology to jungle pastors. I helped to start some churches. Um, I uh, adopted two kids down there. Effectively, what I did was I talked their mother out of an abortion, and then um, I adopted them when they were born. They were twins. They are twins. And uh, it took us 12 years to bring them to the United States. And the only reason I mention that is because I want you to understand that I'm not just someone who's going to say, well, abortion is bad. You can't have abortions. I'm going to say the individual natural rights of those children have to be upheld by the government, but by the society, by the culture, by the community, the people need to come together and take and, and help out with those families to support those, those ladies who uh, would otherwise or might otherwise have had an abortion. It's not just enough to shake your finger in their face and say they're bad. You have to be prepared to support them in making the right choice. And um, I came to West Virginia after I got home from Iraq and, um, I went down to the the uh, Capitol one day and I watched what they were doing there. And frankly, I, I got home angry because it seemed to me that the people in that building in Charleston were making a mockery of what my friends, my brothers and my sisters had offered and some given their lives for, for the uh, individual natural rights of each citizen, for the constitutional governance that protects those individual natural rights. And uh, I got home and I told my wife that I was frustrated about it. And she said, well, you need to do something about it. So we talked about it and decided I would run for delegate. I had no chance. I mean, there was no way in the world I was going to win. I'm going to turn my chair just a little bit. There was no way in the world that I could possibly have won. I had no money. I had no name recognition. I'm not a West Virginia native. I'd moved up here from uh, Louisiana to marry my wife, who was living in West Virginia. And um, 
had no chance at all. And yet I went out, I knocked doors. I said, hi, I'm Marshall. I'm a dad. I'm a husband. I'm a combat veteran. I'm a former missionary. I love the Constitution and I will lay down my life for it. Would you please hire me to be your delegate? And the people of District 60 South Berkeley County hired me uh, against all odds, against all of the, the common, uh, what do they call it, the popular wisdom. I was told repeatedly that I had no chance and that I should just go home. And I didn't. And then uh, I won, a, won re election. And actually, my intent, I've, I finished my master's degree in national security, and my intent was to go get a job in D.C. working in national security. I mean, I, I, I live in the eastern panhandle, 90 miles from D.C., and that was my intent. And then I saw how the primary went, and I thought, I thought, this can't be the way it is. My kids deserve better than this, and I know your kids do, too. I, I want you to understand... I want you to understand this isn't about me. This isn't about my desire to be governor or my personal goals or anything like that. It's about this message. And the message is pretty simple and pretty straightforward. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. And they're endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. To secure these rights, governments are instituted among men drawing their just powers from the consent of the governed. And I, uh, as a member of the legislature, I, I recognized that my job was to be the voice of the people of District 60 in the government. And as I watched the governor issue all these executive orders, an executive order, by the way, is supposed to be an order from the chief executive, the chief of the executive branch, to the executive branch, or to some subunit of the executive branch. It's not to the people. The people aren't in the executive branch. The people don't work for him. It's the opposite. He works for the people managing the executive branch in the name of the people. So when he started issuing all these executive orders, my first action was to contact the Speaker of the House, Roger Hanshaw, and I asked him, could we please have a, a special session so that we can address the fact that the governor is making decisions without the consent of the governed? And he said, well, yeah, what we have to do is get three-fifths of the legislature to agree with us. Well, I couldn't do it. I tried. I spoke with uh, a number of legislators. Basically, I was told that uh, that this this was just the governor doing his job protecting the people. And I repeatedly told folks, legislators, that the governor's job is not to protect the people. The governor's job is to manage the executive branch of the government to uh, uphold and defend the individual natural rights of, of each of the citizens. And of course, you know, things didn't go the way I hoped they would. So I wrote a letter to the governor's office requesting a special session as a legislator saying we need to have a special session. Uh, he not only didn't agree with me, he never even responded. So the, the people of District 60 whom I represent, I was speaking for them. I wrote a letter, an official letter to the governor making an official request, and he simply decided that it wasn't worth even responding. I said, fine. I called John. I had been following John, I guess, for a couple of years mainly for his scavengeology reports. I just get a real kick out of those because I, uh, I really enjoy studying history, but uh, also because I was very interested in some of the cases he'd, uh, he'd managed as the civil rights lawyer. So I, I called him, uh, didn't know him. I said, hey, can you come and meet me and can we talk about this? And he met with me and uh, I completely expected him to say, you know, you're nuts. If you want to uh, sue the governor of the state, you're just crazy. And uh, I thought I'd have to talk him into it. But instead, what he did was said, you know, I've got a good idea. I've got a plan here. I think I know how to do this. What we need to do is go straight to the state Supreme Court and request uh, and, and petition them for a writ of mandamus, a written order from the state Supreme Court telling the state governor that he needs to follow the state constitution and do his job. And uh, so I, I followed his guidance and I was very grateful when a few other um, legislators joined me. That was Delegate Tom Bibby, Delegate uh, Tony Painter, Delegate Jim Butler, and Senator Mike Azinger joined us in this effort. Um, others say they would have, and I, I, you know, others have, have indicated they would have, but the timeline was so short I didn't have time to, to poll each of the legislators and ask them to help out. So we, we actually took this case to the West Virginia Supreme Court, and they refused to hear it. So what you have here is you have a situation where the governor, the executive, has usurped the, the legislative's authority. 
the legislative branch has said, ah, that's all right with us. He can do that. The, the, the legislative, the, the voice of the people, the methodology, the, the technique by which the, uh, the people give their consent to the governed to allow them to be governed justly. Like we said in the uh, Declaration of Independence, it says the government draws its just power from the consent of the governed. If the governed cannot consent, any power they exercise without the consent of the governed is necessarily unjust, period. So your legislator, your legislature laid down and allowed this to happen to you. We went to the judiciary and requested their support, and they told us it wasn't their problem. So that basically left us with no option except to challenge the position of governor. And here I am. It's not me. It's not about me. It's about the message. The message is that governments are instituted among men to secure their natural rights. And my full intent is to is to reform, not just reform, but reform the executive branch of this state government to function according to the Constitution, thereby upholding and defending your individual natural rights. But I want to do it in such a way that it actually makes a spectacle of past governors who have not done that, so that future governors will recognize what's expected of them, but more importantly, so that future voters will realize what they really want in a governor, and also at the same time make a spectacle of the uh, exec of the judiciary and the legislative branches to show what should happen when you when you work together as a functioning government in the uh, uh, separation of powers they actually function together according to the constitution when i say make a spectacle i don't necessarily mean to embarrass or to anger anyone although that might happen what i mean is simply to demonstrate how this thing is supposed to work so i'm asking you to give me that opportunity john i know i've talked for an awful long time is it is it time to go to Q and A? Yeah. Well, we have we have a lot of questions uh, already online, but I'm, I'm going to see first if the people present have questions. But I get to ask the first question anyway. So, <laughs> but I'll just note that I put some of the comments of the people have been making that weren't questions up on the screen because it lets me do that. But the last comment was made by a guy named Infantry Ten, and, <laughs> and he said, "Thank God Wilson is running." So I, I figured you'd appreciate that. Hello, brother. All the way. Obviously a, a, uh, um, an infantryman, I'd say. So I think my first question is just another background question. Um, what, what did you do in the military? I, th I think it would be interesting for people to know um, what, I mean, what, what did you do in the military and why could that experience be important? Okay. Um, and, you know, being the governor of our state sure. as a, as compared to somebody who was just born a billionaire. Right. And I, I want I want people to understand why why they would have a better person That's in the right. position of governor compared to what we have now. So t tell us what you did specifically, what your what your uh, what well, your rank was and experience. Well, if, if you don't mind, I'd, I'd like to actually kind of run through the whole 20 years real quick. I enlisted as an 18-year-old E1, the lowest rank there is, a private without even a rank insignia on my sleeve. Um, and I enlisted as a medic. Um, I worked really hard, did well, um, was, was allowed the opportunity to go to college. While I was in college, I was in a military intelligence National Guard unit, and I was trained as a counterintelligence agent and an interrogator, and I was taught Spanish and German. Uh, I spoke and, and read, read and wrote and spoke Spanish and German both on a, a basically a, a, a fluent level. And then uh, I, in college, I got a degree in comparative ancient religions, but was required to actually declare it as a, uh, as a uh, general studies degree. As a general studies degree, because the Army would not commission me as an infantry officer if I had a degree in religion. So uh, I really wanted to be an infantry officer, and I graduated from college and was commissioned as an infantry second lieutenant. Um, I then went to Fort Riley, Kansas, where I was with the 1st Infantry Division, the Big Red One, and spent four years there. And at the end of my time, I, uh, I resigned my commission, and I moved to Texas, and I started studying and training to become a pastor. Um, I was ordained by a Southern Baptist church in uh, in northern St. Louis, well, actually, North St. Louis County, because I spent some time in Texas, and then I moved up to uh, to St. Louis. 
And um, then I worked for Pioneers International, which is a missions organization out of Orlando, Florida. And the reason that I chose to work with them is because their mission statement is to glorify God by initiating self-propagating church planning movements among the unreached. And that's, that's important because, first of all, their mission is to glorify God. That's what caught my, my eye. It wasn't to build churches. It wasn't to do other things. It was to glorify God by building self-propagating church planning movements among the unreached. What that means is by going in and helping the, the people who are there, the people who are in the community, to do what needs to be done, and then simply to build a sustainable operation that they can then take over and be completely in charge of and then extract yourself from that. Uh, that really appealed to me a lot. And uh, I think, frankly, that's what business needs in West Virginia is not someone to come in from the outside and fix everything and take over, but rather for us to build a self-propagating movement of uh, a self-propagating movement of, of small businesses, of local, locally owned businesses growing and supporting each other. And uh, I, I really think that's the way we need to go. So then uh, as, as a missionary, I, I had seven kids. I adopted two others and then uh, my wife left me. So I couldn't be a missionary anymore. I couldn't be a preacher anymore. I came back to the States. I had to find a way to feed my nine kids. I went back into the army as a 38 year old infantry lieutenant. Shortly thereafter, I made captain. I was given a company command. I commanded sappers. Uh, we were attached to fifth special forces group in Iraq. And uh, we did a did a tour in Iraq. We came home with a meritorious unit citation and uh, a number of individual awards. Uh, my guys did a great job. And then uh, I came home. I married Julie Barr and I moved to West Virginia to be with her. I continued to serve. Now, as I was serving in the guard before I deployed in Louisiana, I helped to rewrite the emergency operations plan for the state of West Virginia after Hurricanes Katrina and Rita. Uh, which was a, a transformative moment in my life. I learned a lot of skills that I had never known before. And um, that, that, that skill set is critical to leading a large organization such as the executive branch of a state government. Uh, problem solving, problem identification, which is huge, because most people try to solve a problem that doesn't even exist rather than actually identifying the problem that, that needs to be solved. Uh, resource management management of personnel, leadership, all those sorts of things. Uh, then I, uh, when I married Julie, I moved up to West Virginia and I was offered a position with Maryland doing basically what I'd done in Louisiana, writing emergency operations plans and running their operations center during snowstorms and things like that. Uh, so I worked there and then uh, ultimately I was, uh, I was offered the position of being the chief uh, of operations for a liaison detachment. So basically what I had was a bunch of highly trained staff officers and NCOs who were experts in their areas. And I was the operations guy. And uh, we went to South Korea where we worked with the first and third Republic of Korea armies and coordinated their battle plans with the U.S. 8th Army. Uh, and you can understand why these would all be critical skills that I'm learning and, and exercising. Um, but we did that while Kim Jong-un was rattling his saber. Um, I like to think that we did our part in convincing him that he wanted to quit rattling his saber and certainly didn't want to move south because we were prepared for it. And I was honored to have a part in making that happen. So I give you all that background, which is probably way more than John wanted me to give you, to let you know that I've had a, a varied and complex experience with the military and as a missionary, but that I've learned so much about how to deal with uh, foreign national leaders, how to work on a high level as a staff officer, as a commander, um, problem solving for extremely complex, intricate, critical, and dangerous problems, and then actually going out and executing them in the field, in the real world. Um, this, this, is, this is what I've done. This is who I am. It's, uh, it's how I function. And I can, I can actually identify the correct problem, analyze the problem itself, apply the assets that we have available, the capabilities we have available, and solve the problem in the most effective, most efficient way possible, recognizing at all times, at all times, that my job as the chief of the executive branch is to ensure that the executive branch of the government is upholding and defending your individual natural rights under the Constitution. That's what I intend to do, and I hope you'll give me the chance to do it. Does that get close to answering your question, John? Yeah, thanks. I'm 
I uh, I think that was a better answer than than I expected. I I, I want to ask one more question before I turn it over to somebody else. But uh, um, just tell us at least. Uh, I think you have a different perspective than almost everybody else because you've been, as I said, a missionary in in South America, not just what might first pop in your head, but I mean, you've told me stories of meeting people who had never even seen a book before. And I think that gives you a perspective on our country and, and the government's role in that. Could you at least just give us one, one, uh, missionary story to, you know, for people to, you know, to help them understand kind of the, the really super interesting background that you have and, and, um, and really the dedication that you have to, to, to service. Yes, sir. Thank you. So, uh, one of my, one of my favorite experiences was, uh, I went up a river where they had never, not only not ever seen anyone who was of Irish extraction like I am, but they'd never actually seen a, a Hidalgo, a Spaniard. Now, some of the people in the village actually spoke Spanish, but very few of them. Most of them spoke only the, the local native uh, tongue, the, the tribal tongue. And uh, I went up river for eight days in which, a... Which country? This is in Peru, northern Peru. Went up river for eight days in a dugout canoe with a little motor on it with a shaft on it that had a propeller about that big. And the idea behind the shaft was you could lift the... You could uh, lever the, the, the shaft, the, the propeller out of the water if you were hitting logs or whatever. Yeah, we had those, uh, we had those in Florida in the swamps. Yeah. They, yeah. They well, in Peru, they call them pecky peckies because the motors go pecky, 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 pecky. <laughs> but uh, went eight days upriver to this village, and uh, I finally just, you know, we got out of the boat every now and then, but uh, I got really tired of sitting on this bag of rice that we were taking up to them. And I finally asked the, the guy who was running the boat, I said, could, we just, could I just get out and stretch my legs? So he pulled over and I climbed up the bank because it was dry season. So I had to climb about 20 feet up the bank out of the river. And as I got up there, I looked around and I saw this one little shack sitting right on the edge of the river, you know, right up on the, the bank of the river. And uh, I thought, well, this is, you know, this is a good chance as any to talk to somebody in this area. So I walked over there and as I got closer, I realized that what I had thought was a stick poking out the front of the shack was actually the barrel of a machine gun. So I very carefully advanced. And as I got a little closer, I started talking. Hello. Hello. This is my name is in the jungle. They called me Mashko. I said, I'm Mashko. I'm here to visit. You know, could I please say hello? And this young uh, Peruvian lieutenant walks out of the walks out of the back of the, uh, the shack and he starts yelling at me. He says, what are you doing here? Who are you? Who sent you? I said, well, nobody sent me. I just came to say hello, and I want to meet some people in this area, and I'm Mashko. And he goes, Mashko, Mashko. I said, yeah. He says, were you in El Chino, the village of El Chino, you know, a few days ago? I said, well, yeah, about three weeks ago. He says, do you remember? And he describes this woman. And I said, yes. Well, what he described was this very tiny little woman, and most of the people in the jungle are very tiny, but this woman was especially tiny, who had asked me to baptize her but she told me she was afraid of the water. So uh, I have to take her out into the river to baptize her, but she's afraid of the water. And there were about 30 other people that I baptized that day. So we, we kept her for last and uh, <laughs> walked over to the river. You know, I was in the river. She walked over and she's, she's very timid. And I reached out my hand and I, and she gave me her hand, but she kept resisting me as I tried to, to bring her. So finally, I literally picked her up like a child and walked out into the river. And as I was just about to baptize her, she climbed up on top of my head to get away from the water. And uh, I said, ma'am, look, if, if we're going to do this baptism, you have to go into the water. Now, there are other ways to do a baptism. We can we can go back on land. I can pour water over your head. I can sprinkle you. Whatever. God doesn't care. He just loves you and wants you to know that that he loves you. And uh, she said, uh, she said, no, 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 we have to do it this way. That's the way you did it with everyone else. So finally, she said, you just have to baptize me. So. I was able to, to get her down and I into, into my arms and I real quick dunked her and picked her back up. And then I walked her over and I set her on the edge, on, on the riverbank. Three weeks later, I'm in this other village. I meet this guy with a machine gun who uh, wants to know what I'm doing there and who sent me. When I tell him I'm Mashko, he says, he says, do you know this woman? And he describes this woman in this situation. And I said, yeah. He says, well, I want to let you know. I don't know what you told her, but 
that woman is the meanest human being I've ever known. And for the past three weeks, she's, she's been one of the nicest people I've ever known in my life. And I said, well, I, I don't take credit for that. You know, I mean, that's her and God. That's whatever they've worked out. But because of that, because of that, he actually invited me. He was the, this, this 22-year-old lieutenant was the military governor of this region. He was in charge militarily in this entire region. It was his job to shoot anyone who tried to pass his shack on the river. So if I had, if I had continued another hundred yards, he would have shot me with his machine gun. But instead, because I got too tight, you know, my legs got, uh, I got cramps in my legs and I needed to get out. Uh, if I had not gotten out when I did, he would have shot me as I passed by on the river. And if I had not baptized his wife three days before or three weeks before, he wouldn't have allowed me into the village. But that's just, Crazy. yeah, that's. Uh, All right. So I've, I have more questions, but I've asked enough. Yes, sir. Vince, do you have, do you have anybody else have a question? I do. Okay. Well, All right. Well, yes, ma'am. I don't want to sound like a smart aleck, <laughs> but I want to know who are you? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Maybe repeat the questions. So she, that... uh, nice lady asked, uh, who am I? She said, I don't want to sound like a smart aleck, but who are you? Okay, well, uh, let's do it this way, if I may. Let's just do this. All right, is it working now? I think. Can someone tell me, is it working now? We lost our mic for just a second. Is it working now? Can you tell? Oh, yeah, it's working. Yes, somebody comment it's working. All right. All right. Thank you, John. Sorry about that. Um, I am the currently serving delegate from District 60, which is South Berkeley County. I'm the only independent serving in the legislature, and I am currently your independent candidate for governor. What else would you like to know, ma'am? Well, they're wondering all about your service and being baptizing and being a minister, but you've never said, I am a Christian. I am absolutely a believer in Jesus Christ. I am, <clears throat> I am absolutely dependent upon the grace of God as exercised by the act of Jesus on the cross. Yes, ma'am. This, this is, the, well, I mean, a lot of people will say they're a Christian. I'm telling you what I believe so that you can, you can see that I'm a Christian. I'm, I'm demonstrating it for you rather than just saying the words. Because a lot of people will say those words, but they don't know what they mean. Yes, ma'am. Well, it takes, it takes one thing. Uh, well, um, I believe... Uh, I have confessed Jesus Christ as my Lord, and I believe that God's raised him from the dead. Yes, ma'am. You know what? I will make sure, make sure you repeat the question. Yeah, oh, because good point. Can't hear. Yes, yes, sir. Thank you. So what changes can I make as governor that will make things be different? I will focus on dismantling and reconstructing the executive branch of the government to function strictly according to the constitution of West Virginia and of the United States that will cause the executive branch of the government 
to function in such a way that it upholds and defends your individual natural rights. Your individual natural rights are, of course, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Pursuit of happiness, if we read the philosophers who developed that concept, generally focuses on your, uh, your private property, your private property, which includes yourself, okay? And the reason that's important is because anything that you own, you either earned or you created, right? And you earned or created it by the investment of your time, your effort, your capabilities, your creativity. And because, of, because you own yourself, you own whatever you earn or create. Does that make sense? So what we're actually saying is you have a right to live, you have a right to do as you will, and you have a right to do as you will with what you've earned or created, right? Those are your natural rights. Once the government functions, actually according to those guidelines, you will not be overtaxed. Your private business will not be shut down. You will not be told to stay in your house because those are not valid functions of a government. Valid function of a government is to uphold and defend your individual natural rights and nothing else. So I will, given the opportunity, I will absolutely teach the federal government I'm sorry, teach the executive branch of the state government to function according to the Constitution. And once I've actually managed to instill that, that understanding in the government itself, I will go on and teach it a little bit of uh, customer service. I'll teach it to understand that it works for you. So when you go to the DMV and somebody says, well, you got to jump through these hoops and you got to say these words and you got to kiss my ring and, or, or whatever other branch of the government it is, the response that you'll get instead when you walk in is, thank you for coming, ma'am. May I please help you? Yes, ma'am. I understand what you're trying to accomplish. Here's what's actually required. Let me help you accomplish that rather than, well, go away until you figured it out and you can come back. That's in my travels around the state. One of the biggest complaints that I've got is people will go to their local branch of the state government and ask for a little bit of help, DMV, whatever, uh, you know, whatever branch it is, Secretary of State's office. And what they will get in return is, well, I'm sorry you don't know how to do this. Please go away until you figure it out. And that is... That is completely unacceptable. I will retrain your state government to not only function according to the Constitution, but to serve you under the Constitution. Because we the people, you the people are in charge here. You hold all the power. And it's about time somebody reminded the government of that fact. That's my intent. Yes, ma'am. Sure yeah, yes, ma'am. Uh, people who people who engage in the function of government often are the sorts of people who, if you remember, in the sixth grade when you had that one kid, the teacher always let take names. You know, when she left the room, she leaves one of the kids in charge. Well, all those kids grow up and they join the government. And, and there is nothing they enjoy more than making you, they've got this little tiny gate that everybody has to go through and it makes them feel powerful and it makes them feel like they matter, that they can force people to behave a certain way to get through that gate. That needs to be flipped completely around. It is sta The government stands on its head right now because it believes that it's in charge. And what it needs to understand is it is our slave. The government is our slave. It is our bond servant. We own it. We pay to f for the function of this government, we have established this government. We, the people, we, the people form the government and we formed it for the only valid reason any government can exist, which is to uphold and defend our individual natural rights. If that government fails to uphold and defend our individual natural rights, it is invalid and must be changed. If it does anything other than uphold our, and defend our individual natural rights, it is oppressive and certainly must be changed. It's time to change our government. Give me a chance to do it. Now, I want to be really, this is important. I'm sorry. I know, I know it's probably time to move on, but this is important. I, a lot of people ask me what makes me think that I can do it. And the simple fact of the matter is I can't. The power doesn't lie with me. It lies with you. All just powers of the government are drawn from consent of the governed. That's us. We, the people. Me personally, I can't do that. So the fact of the matter is we, the people, hold the power. What do we, the people, not have? that will allow us to exercise that power effectively. We don't have knowledge of what's going on. It's all opaque to us. It's all hidden. I will walk in there and I will open every closet. I will open every, every storage room. I will open every basement and I will expose to the world exactly what's going on in our government. And then it's up to you. 
you the people to do something about it. You the people to fire your elected employees who are behaving in a way that doesn't uphold and defend your individual natural rights. It will be up to you to restructure your government. So that's what I intend to do. It's not, it's not about me going in and fixing all the problems in West Virginia. It's about me going in, determining what the problems are based on my analytical skills that I've learned from the Army and, and from a, a lot of government work that I've done. Go in there, actually do the analysis, figure out what the actual problems are, and hold them up for you to see. It's really that simple. Thank you, ma'am. Um, um, before we move off of religion, I think there's an action. There, we have a, a comment question that I think is pretty interesting, and I'd like to hear your answer, uh, how you answer it. Uh, not something I expected uh, to be asked, but it's a, it's a good question. Gerald Wilson asks, you should know that at least one of your voters, um, I think he meant to say, are not Christian. I am an Odinist pagan. How how does that make you feel and everyone feel? So I, I, I think his question is, even though he, this guy supports your policies right. and he's he's one of your supporters, um, given that you are a you are a preacher, that you have served as a missionary and that that's a, a part of who you are, um, how should he feel about that being that he personally is an Odinist pagan? Mr. Wilson, it's an honor to meet you. I'm sure we're cousins somewhere back. I'm actually from Clan Gunn up in the northern part of Scotland. And uh, my clan, of course, was formed by uh, Gunner, who was a Scandinavian, uh, a, uh, a Viking. And uh, so anyway, we, we probably go back the same way. Anyway, what it comes down to is, first of all, I want to be very clear about the fact that my feelings don't matter. Uh, what does matter is the truth and uh, how we understand it and how we apply it. And the fact is that the truth is that the only valid reason for any government to exist is to uphold and defend your individual natural rights. So as your governor, I will absolutely dedicate myself to upholding and defending your individual natural rights. And of course, one of your individual natural rights is to believe as you will. I have no desire to legislate Christianity. First of all, because I wouldn't be a legislator, I'd be the governor. But I also have have no desire for the government to impose Christianity on anyone or any of the tenets of Christianity. What I do intend to do is to use the government to uphold and defend your individual natural rights. Now, I want to be very clear about the fact that Western civilization and that concept of upholding and defending your individual natural rights is founded on a three legged stool, a three legged platform. Those three legs are Jerusalem, Athens and Rome. Jerusalem, of course, is the home of the Judeo-Christian ethic. That is, what, that is what informs everything that I do, the Judeo-Christian ethic, which means that I tell the truth. I do what I say I'm going to do. I show up when I'm supposed to be somewhere. I, uh, I apologize when I make a mistake, and I forgive those who make mistakes, and then I try to do better. So you can expect that from me. You can demand it from me. Uh, Athens, of course, would be the philosophy and uh, the, the rationale, the uh, rationalism that came out of Greek philosophy. And then, of course, Rome, which is where the, uh, the administrative state comes from. And I, I know you probably hate the administrative state as much as I do, but what we really hate is the corruption of it. The administrative state functioning, as I described a while ago, uh, to support the, the free exercise of the individual people's natural rights is actually a blessing, whereas uh, the corrupted administrative state, which takes over and tries to force you into doing things that you shouldn't have to do, uh, it needs to be dismantled, of course. So what we're talking about here is how does my Christianity inform my service? Quite simply, what it means is that I, it is demanded that I be humble, that I be honest, uh, that I do my best to be wise, that I do my best to serve you according to the Constitution, that I admit when I'm wrong, that I try to do better, that I ask for forgiveness, and that I offer forgiveness when it's, when it's required. That's how my Christianity affects and informs my uh, my service. It does not mean that um, I believe that your right to behave as you will should be infringed upon by my my personal proclivities. There are a lot of things that other people choose to do that I think are a really bad idea. And as your as your friend, as your neighbor, as your family member, as your pastor, that might actually be relevant. As your governor, it's completely irrelevant what I think. All that's relevant is whether or not I will uphold and defend your individual natural rights. That's it. 
So I have no desire to impose my beliefs on anyone, but I will try very hard to live in such a way that you will see how I behave and say, I want whatever that guy's got. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, I think you, I think you did answer his question. He had also, I know you couldn't see it, but he had also said clan gun. Yes. Clan so, gun. Outstanding. so, uh, cousin. yeah, that, I think you? that, not sure. Yeah. I mean, contrast, I think all you need to do is contrast that answer to an, a, a, a very complex and difficult topic and question to the mumbling that our current governor does on a daily basis that, I mean, it, it's not stringing three different thoughts together within a 10 minute period, or you can contrast it with the de debate that happened last night. That it, Really there, there was hardly any intelligent exchange of ideas or nor was it intended to, to be that way with the inflammatory uh, direction of the questions that were asked. So, I mean, that I think that was a great answer, but there, I was going through some of the other questions and I think there's a great, not a follow-up question, but a question from Anna Workman that really gets to the heart of what I think people need to know. And now that we have experienced, we now that we know the answer of what our current governor would do, in the current times, because we've lived it, um, Anna, Anna asks, uh, we the people want to know how would you how you would exercise the power given to you as governor to implement all the resolutions to fix the state's problems. So I, I would also I mean, I would I would say also I would add to that, you know, what what would you have done differently with with the coronavirus stuff and what and then also what would you do? What would you do uh, with your power as governor to fix other problems in the state? So if you don't mind, I'd like to start with the general question, generally how to, how to, how to deal with problems. Um, sure. Yeah, you should okay, be good. Great. So if I can, I'd like to start with the broader context and then, and then narrow it down to the, the coronavirus response. Um, so basically it's important to note that there, there are actually two different kinds of authority that, that any, basically anyone has in whatever situation as a father, as a, uh, you know, as a business leader, uh, whatever. And, and those are delegated authority, which is the formal official authority that you have by dent of your office or title or education or whatever comes along with that. So, uh, as governor, the only reason you exist is to manage the executive branch of the government, to lead and direct the executive branch of the government in such a way that it, it, it secures the free exercise of the individual natural rights of each citizen. That is it. That's the only power that the governor has that, that is actually a directorial uh, capability. In other words, he, the only people he can tell what to do are the executive branch, members of the executive branch, and he can only tell them what to do in pursuit of that mission of upholding and defending your individual natural rights. Now, there is another kind of power, but it's not, it's not delegated, it's not official, it's actually personal influence. And personal influence is a result of character, knowledge, uh, compassion, uh, involvement, engagement, that sort of thing. Um, so our current governor, based on his position, has all the same authority that past governors have had and that future governors will have, unless we amend the Constitution. Um, he is he has usurped other authorities that are not his, and he has not been challenged by those who own those authorities to give them back, which is a crying shame for all of us. Um, but what he has done is, I think he has recognized that he has no personal influence because personal influence is based on character, integrity, knowledge, capabilities, compassion, engagement. That's where personal influence comes from. And frankly, for a long haul, for a sustained effort, personal influence, <clears throat> personal influence is a much more important and much more effective type of leadership, much more effective kind of power than is delegated authority because delegated authority has all those strictures on it. So having laid that foundation, what I would say is 
first of all, <clears throat> first of all, I would have executed my assigned duties. No others, but my assigned duties under the Constitution, and I would have encouraged, used my personal influence to encourage other uh, elected employees to actually execute their assigned duties under the Constitution, i.e., I would have called in the legislature. So given all of that, let me back up and start at the very beginning, actually before we found out about COVID and tell you what I would have done about this situation and use that as an example to describe what I will do in every given situation because I've done it before, because I know how to do it. First thing is I would have had a plan. Now, a lot of people are saying, well, you can't plan for something you don't know is gonna happen. That's, that's absolutely not true. Um, I, I spent years in operational planning with the U.S. Army. The big part of that was projecting what plans, what, uh, what issues we might have down the road. And of course, the way you do that is you look at historical precedent. So what I'm saying is I wrote what's called all hazards operations plans for the Army, starting in Louisiana and then also going to Maryland. So an all hazard, a hazard is any potential threat. So what we tried to focus on was terrorist threats, um, weather threats, hurricanes, tornadoes, snowfall, that sort of thing. But then we also consider pandemics. So I have literally written plans for how the state government is required to respond to a pandemic. They actually exist. It's not like pandemics have never happened. It's not like we don't have historical precedent upon which to build these plans. So I've actually been involved in building these plans and uh, you know, we've, we've done a pretty good job. So what you do is you build a generic plan that says, Generally speaking, in this situation, we will have these issues to deal with. Given all of the capabilities that we have at this time, we can apply these capabilities, these assets, these personnel, uh, this amount of money, these logistics to solving this issue, the issues that are raised by this situation. Uh, it's, a, it's a model that, that I have used for years, for decades. It works very well. And uh, what you do is you build a base plan that is generally, generally structures how you think about that particular issue in the case that it might happen. Then when you get word that there might actually be that issue preparing to occur, and what I mean by that is, like when I worked in Louisiana, every time that a hurricane was out in the Atlantic, we watched it as it came through the Caribbean, as it came into the, uh, the, the, Gulf, uh, the Gulf of Mexico, and as it approached us. And we had our base plan and we had, we Quickly, we uh, constantly refine that base plan on intelligence updates or information updates that we received about what was likely to happen based on the way that the, the storm was moving. You can do the same thing with a pandemic. Pandemics move physically. Pandemics transfer from one person to another. That's how they're transmitted. So you can actually chart their movement. So once we knew that New York City was a, uh, you know, a, a ground zero for a particular uh, outbreak of this of this illness then what we could do is we could actually chart from there when it was likely to come here and what effects it was likely to have so what i would have done is first of all i would have had that base plan ready and that is absolutely within the governor's purview that is absolutely an executive branch job that should be done and uh you know as as your governor i would engage uh, would be one of the first things that i did would be to engage with uh with the emergency operations people in this state and actually prepare not just a pandemic plan, but an all hazards plan that actually has branch plans for each of the potential hazards that we see coming. Given that, when we found out that Corona or COVID was headed our way, what I would have done is I would have done exactly what Jim Justice did at the beginning. I would have declared a state of preparedness. Now, according to West Virginia state law, a state of preparedness can last up to 30 days. At the end of that 30 days, you either have to declare a state of emergency or you have to simply end the state of preparedness. It can only last 30 days. So I would have declared that state of preparedness and I would have used that time to extract our standard base plan for pandemic and then bring in all of the smart people who had anything to do with re responding to it at all. And we would have adjusted that base plan based on the new information we had. We would have maintained what's called a rolling staff update. We would have continued to update the plan based on the information we had. In doing that, in conducting that analysis and applying that new information as it was became, it become very clear that it was unlikely that there would ever be an emergency from COVID in West Virginia. And of course, a lot of people are saying, well, how can you say there's not an emergency? There's this illness 
it's in West Virginia and, and a few people have died. Some people have died. Well, here's the thing. An emergency actually is defined as the technical term for what we're talking about is defined as the imminent, which means it's right on top of you or ongoing, meaning it's actually happening. The imminent or ongoing destruction of key critical infrastructure, roads, bridges, buildings. That's not happening, guys. Nothing's being destroyed. Of large amounts, vast amounts of private property. That's not happening either, except, well, it is happening, but not from COVID, from the government's response to COVID. So actually, the government has created an emergency, whereas COVID never did. And finally, of massive amount, massive loss of human life. Look, we have lost people. I regret that. And, and I tell you what, if somebody in my family is lost, that is an emergency for my family. But what we're talking about here is a state emergency. It is not an emergency for the state. And, and I don't mean to sound like I don't care. I'm just saying that a massive response is not warranted by the loss of, it's gotta be a massive loss of life for it to trigger a state response. So in applying the new information in going through the new analysis, the new conclusion would have been, there is no emergency. So at the end of that 30 days, instead of declaring a state of emergency, I, as your governor, would have ended the state of preparedness. However, I want to be very clear about this. At the end of that state of preparedness, we would have updated our plans. We would have already established triggers, and I'll get to triggers in just a second, for when we should call in the legislature to appropriate funds. And I would never appropriate funds without the legislature's uh, involvement because that's their job, constitutionally speaking, and because they speak for you. It's your money. I don't appropriate your money. The legislature does because they speak for you. You appropriate your money through your elected representatives. So I would have had the plan. I would have refined it. At the end of the 30 days, I would have had everyone in the government on, uh, on standby, on call, because I would tell them, as soon as we get to this point, as soon as we have this number of infections, or as soon as we have this issue going on, and I would define it very clearly, I will need you to do this, to execute these steps. And then I would stay on top of it. I would maintain vis uh, visibility of it. And I would go on about the other business of the state while doing that. You can't, you know, I mean, it's, it's something I experienced in combat. You've got one guy shooting at you and he's shooting at you most effectively. So you forget everything else and you go and you focus everything you've got on that one guy. And when you do that, his 43 friends get you from the flank and completely wipe you out. So what we've done is we've got this one guy who presents a big target. He looks scary. And that's COVID. And we've responded. The response is completely out of scope with the actual threat. Meanwhile, the real threats that we're experiencing, the actual emergency that we have now is we've destroyed our economy. And not only have we destroyed our economy for a few months, a lot of people seem to think that what we did was we just lost the income. And I'm talking about the businesses. I'm not talking about the government. The state government can live without your money, uh, you know, and it needs to learn how. What I'm talking about is the actual businesses, the families who run these businesses. So not only have we lost that income, what we've actually lost is, well, think about it in, the, in terms of farming. If, if rats get in, thanks, John. If rats get in and they eat your seed corn, you have nothing to plant for the next year. So you haven't just lost the butt end of this, this year's crop. You've lost next year's complete crop. And not only next year's, but where are you going to get the seed corn for the next year and the next year and the next year? And that's what we've done here in trying to respond to one threat, which could actually turn into an emergency. And we need to keep an eye on it. We need to be wise about it. I'm not saying there's no way that COVID will never be an emergency, will ever be an emergency for West Virginia. I'm saying that there is no justifiable way for saying that it's an emergency right now. Certainly not one that merits taking unconstitutional action and destroying businesses and destroying families and destroying the, the, the uh, legacy that they've built for their, their children and for their grandchildren. There is nothing that's going on right now that merits that, that warrants that. What I'm saying is we prepare in the way that I've already described. We are prepared in case the threat becomes real. It actually uh, manifests as an emergency. We're prepared to deal with that. Meanwhile, we're dealing with all the other issues that we normally have to deal with. We can't just shut everything else down. So uh, I hope I hope that gives kind of a, 
a structure for what I would do. If you want to talk about specific actions that I would take, quite frankly, uh, um, most of those have to do with mobilizing the executive branch of the government to support you as you keep yourself safe. And then also ensuring that our medical system is prepared to support you if you become ill. A critical part of that is making sure that our, uh, our medical personnel have the protective equipment that they need, the PPE that they need, but also ensuring that we have plans in place to bring in backups for our medical personnel if they become ill or exhausted. And, uh, you know, exhaustion for medical personnel. And, you know, my, my wife is a military uh, nurse anesthetist, so I, I've seen it happen. It's not just physical exhaustion. It's, it's compassion fatigue. It's, it's similar to PTSD like you would get from combat, but it's, it's actually from dealing with people who are suffering so horribly and you care so much about them that it actually just wears you down. Uh, we have to be able to rotate people out. In, in the case of an actual pandemic emergency, we would have to have a plan in place. And that would actually be a valid function of the executive branch of the government. Shutting down your private business is completely unacceptable and, and is not within the purview of the, the, the executive branch of the government. I, I hope that addresses your issue, and I hope I haven't talked way too much. Okay, um, we have we, we're way behind with the answer with online questions. Fault, sorry. No, no, no. It's, it's not your fault. It's 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 substance. But we have a question from this is this is Vips. She runs a a beautiful bed and breakfast down the road here, down, um, and she has a, a very good question, which she which she had kind of whispered in my ear, and and I think a lot of people probably have this question. Is well, let me put it up here. All right, so I put it up in the form of a question for me. But here's a question: Can you? I don't think this was explained today, but can you explain to the people listening why you switched parties to be an independent? Sure. And the strengths and the challenges of doing that. Thank you for asking, Ms. Phipps. And she, she added, and the strengths and the challenges of doing that. <clears throat> I grew up in the Deep South in a deeply Democrat area. And these were what some people call blue dog Democrats, very patriotic Democrats, served in the military, worked hard, paid their taxes, went to church, loved their families, uh, worked in their communities, took care of each other. Um, and this is the way I was raised in a very small town in South Louisiana. But when I was in high school, Ronald Reagan was the president. And I watched that guy. I was fascinated by him. And uh, the things that he said about who we are as people, who we are as a people, um, who our nation is supposed to be, and, and what our duties are, not only to, to ourselves and to each other, but for generations to come. Um, now, I, I got to be honest, my dad, who was a combat veteran Marine and a Southern Baptist preacher, might have actually prepared the ground for President Reagan. But when, when I heard President Reagan speak, all I could think was, there's a man who actually understands what's going on and what should be going on. So when I turned 18, I graduated from high school, and then I turned 18, and I uh, enlisted in the Army, and I registered to vote as a Republican because Ronald Reagan was a Republican. And I believed that Ronald Reagan exemplified what the Republican Party was all about. Transparency, small government, integrity, constitution, uh, personal responsibility, looking out for each other. Now, a lot of people think that because I say personal responsibility and looking out for each other that I'm contradicting myself. I'm not at all. I am absolutely responsible for myself. And every now and then I need a little help. You don't owe it to me but I need it. And nobody owes me any help at all, but some people have helped me throughout my life. There was a time when I was a single father of nine kids, single father, nine kids. I needed some help. Nobody owed it to me. I worked really hard to take care of my kids and to pay my bills. And thank God a few people helped me out along the way. So what I'm saying is it was my responsibility and yet I got help, but I never tried to compel anybody. I never demanded that help from anybody because they don't owe it to me. So that's what I believed the Republican Party was all about, because that's what Ronald Reagan taught me. So I joined the Army. I went my way. I did my thing. <clears throat> I, I voted every time I got a chance, um, every time that you know I was in a place where I could vote and I, I knew what was going on. 
never really got engaged too much, but you know, I, I found the process fascinating when I did engage. And uh, over the years, of course, as, uh, as a soldier, I was never able to actually be a part of the process other than voting. I mean, I couldn't campaign for anyone. I couldn't help anybody run their campaigns because I was in uniform. I was fine with that. You know, you guys know the Hatch Act. The Hatch Act. So um, <clears throat> later I became a, a preacher. And of course, I had my opinions based on what I believe and who I am. But um, I didn't engage in those discussions with people because there were much more important things that as a pastor I needed to discuss with them. And then, and then I came home from Iraq and the experience there brought it all into sharp relief for me. That this wasn't just some chess game that we were playing. That it wasn't just about who's a better speaker, or who has better ideas, or who can leverage this issue into that issue. It was about a life and death. About young men and women dying. And uh, as you probably heard me say before, that uh, when I enlisted at 18, I studied the Constitution because I looked at the oath and I realized that the oath was to the Constitution, that I took an oath to uphold and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And I, it, it surprised me. It surprised me to know that my oath was to uphold the Constitution. I thought it was to defend the United States, or I thought it would be to protect the people of the United States, to protect the government of the United States, but it's none of those. It's to uphold and defend the Constitution. And because that's what it was, I had to understand what the Constitution was and what it said. So, I, you know, I'd taken a civics class in high school, but I went back and I really read it. And I read the supporting documents and the philosophies that came behind it. And I came to understand that in defending the Constitution, I would uphold and defend the individual natural rights of each citizen and in doing so, I would protect the people of the United States. I would defend our, our uh, uh, physical territory. I would protect the government and help the government to understand what its job was. So I began trying to understand those things when I was 18, and that percolated for decades while I was serving in the Army. And then I, I went to Iraq. I commanded 130 men. Thank God I brought them all home. But when I got here, when I came home, I really wanted to know what it was all about. So I went to Charleston, walked into the Capitol. I sat in some committee hearings. I had no desire to go into politics. I still don't. I had no desire at all. Walked in and I, I thought all these smart people were working really hard to make the, <clears throat> make the government work according to the Constitution to serve the people. And I thought, you know, the only thing that's really going on here is a lot of really good, smart people are trying hard to make that happen. And that they just disagree with each other on how to do that. So I sat in these committee hearings and I, I watched the floor session from the gallery. And I came to understand that very few of them, not only did very few of them care about the Constitution or our individual natural rights, the relationship between those concepts and the blood we spilled, they had no idea there was a relationship. Not only did they not care, they didn't even know. And when I ask a few questions about how this or that issue was relevant to the Constitution, I got blank stares. I went home to the captain. Um, and uh, she asked me what was bothering me because I guess it was pretty apparent that, that I was still pretty wound up. And I told her. I told her basically what I've just told you. Well, Julie, being a naval officer, a prior enlisted foreman with the Marines and, you know, a veteran of three deployments. Three deployments. Your wife. My wife. She said... You need to do something about this. I said, what am I going to do? I'm nobody. I don't know anything. 
certainly not a politician. I don't know how to talk to people. I mean, I'm a grunt. I'm an infantryman. Um, I don't know how to maneuver all the political processes and get people on my side so we can all go and make things happen. And she said, we need to figure it out. I said, I have no interest in being a politician. She said, I know. That's why I want you to be my delegate. So I kind of blew it off. I thought, well, you know, it's maybe one of these days I'll, uh, I'll seriously consider doing something like that after I've had a chance to, to study or whatever. And I actually started looking into master's programs and got into one in D.C. to uh, get a master's in national security so I can understand these things. But meanwhile, um, <laughs> our delegate decided to run for state treasurer, which meant that his seat was, was vacated. And um, I, I signed up to run. I had no money, no name recognition, not from the state. I'm not, a, I'm not a, a native of West Virginia. I love it here. Got a lot of good friends here, but you know, I, my granddaddy wasn't born here, you know, and uh, that's, that seems to be a pretty big issue for some folks in this state. But I had no chance of winning, none. Everybody told me so. The Republican Executive Committee in Berkeley County, when I announced that I was running, they actually tried to talk me into withdrawing and going home. And frankly, that made me so angry that I decided I was going to win. And I uh, had no idea how to win. None. No clue. So what I did was I just went next door and I knocked on the door and I said, hey, I've uh, signed up to run for delegate. Would you hire me to be your delegate? And my nice neighbor said, well, sure. And I went to the next door and the next door and the next door. And uh, the next thing that I knew, I was out of my district. I didn't, didn't know what I was doing. I had no idea. I didn't know that there was any way to find out who were the registered voters in your district. I didn't know these things and nobody was giving me the information I needed to do a good job. So I figured all this out the hard way. I asked some hard questions. Actually, uh, one of the people who helped me out the most was Mike Folk. Uh, he told me that it was possible to get voters registration. And so I did that. And then I focused my efforts on, on, uh, the actual voters in my district. But the thing is, I, I didn't have a big machine. I didn't have, I didn't have, you know, TV ads. I didn't have money. I didn't have any recognition. All I had was a message and it's the same message I have today. All men are created equal. The only valid reason for the government to exist is to uphold and defend your individual natural rights. If it doesn't do that, it's an invalid government and must be changed. If it does anything other than that, it's an oppressive government and certainly must be changed. Same message I had five years ago. Same message I have today. Same message I'll have five years from now and then I'll carry to my grave. That's it. It's that simple. So in doing that, I got elected and I'm, I'm really trying to get around to answer your question, ma'am. I know. I just go on for days, but as a Republican. yes, ma'am. I was elected as a Republican for my first term. I was reelected as a Republican, frankly, uh, with the resistance of many members of the executive committee and in, in my, in my, uh, County, um, they actually recruited someone to run against me in my primary. I won. Um, I went to Charleston and I was actually elected to the County executive committee, the Berkeley County Republican executive committee. <laughs> As a member of that committee, I started going to meetings and trying to give my input. And I basically was told that I just needed to uh, go along. And I said, well, you know, you guys, I've been a delegate for two years at this point. You know, that's not what I'm going to do. I'm going to keep insisting that we follow the Constitution, that we follow. We just got a flyover, guys. So uh, no doubt Helga is. Helga is busted through the door and hiding. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> I was working with the executive committee because I wanted our party, the Republican Party, to support the Republican Party platform and to do things the right way. So uh, at one point, I actually, this was in December of uh, 2018, right after the election. I was a member of the executive committee. We had a, we had a meeting at which, oh, here they come again. We had a meeting in which we discussed 
what had happened during the election and what we could do better. And uh, a fellow member of the committee, a gentleman named Samson Wright, um, I, I wasn't able to make the meeting. I was in Charleston uh, with the legislature doing some work for the legislature. And uh, my friend Samson Wright was raising some issues. He went to the restroom, and when he came back, he had been voted off the committee. And he called me and told me this. And I said, oh, well, that's a mistake. They, they can't just vote you off the committee like that. There has to be a process, an impeachment sort of a thing, because you were elected by the voters of your magisterial district. They can't just decide you're not on the committee anymore. That's disenfranchising all your voters. He said, well, I believe that. You believe that. What are we going to do about it? So I called the chairwoman of the West Virginia Republican Party, and I asked her to uh, tell me how she wanted me to deal with this. And uh, her response was that I needed to learn how to get along with people. I said, well, that's not particularly helpful. I want to know how to deal with this issue. And she said that she didn't really have time to talk to me. So I sent her emails, which were never responded to. I made phone calls, which were never responded to. Um, finally, I started contacting the uh, state executive committee. And members of the state executive committee became very unhappy with me and told me that I needed to shut up and toe the line. And I I'm not very good at that. And I said, look, here's the Constitution. Here's our party platform. Here's what we're doing over here. Can we please make this look like this? That's all I'm asking. Can we just do what we say we're going to do? And uh, finally, after I had done that for a while and been ignored, I wrote a, an open letter calling for Melody Potter's resignation, the chairwoman of the West Virginia Republican Party, because she absolutely refused to uphold the principles of the West Virginia Republican Party. She finally decided she wanted to talk to me, but not till after she'd gone on Hoppy Kirchival's program and maligned me for an extended period of time. She finally said she would see me. I went to her office. She had a gentleman there who yelled at me and told me to shut up because I didn't know how to, how to talk to people, and I was being very respectful. I simply was saying things they didn't want to hear. Ultimately, at the end of this conversation, uh, she made it very clear that I wasn't wanted in the West Virginia Republican Party, that they don't want people like me. And I said, yes, ma'am, I understand. I am not going to force myself on people who don't want me. And I went and declared that I was an independent. I changed my voter's registration to independent. Uh, it was not my intent at that time to run for governor. Um, that was December of 2019. January of 2019, once I began to understand who actually was running for governor, I endorsed Michael Folk. And uh, I started talking with some really smart people I know about the potential for an independent run if Mike didn't win the Republican primary. And I started preparing for that. I used all the tools that the Army gave me, and I prepared for the eventuality, the potential of uh, an independent run uh, because I, I saw it as a real uphill climb for Michael to win the primary. I mean, he's going against the incumbent billionaire who has the party support and, frankly, President Trump's endorsement, uh, which made it really hard. And then, of course, the next gentleman who was running is a multimillionaire with statewide name recognition. So I reckon, and not only with that, but Mike was running against the Republican Party. So I saw all of that as a, a, a really difficult task, and I thought we could use a backup. So I prepared myself in the eventuality that Mike did not pull out a win in the primary, that perhaps I could step in as an independent. And of course, that's the way it turned out. Um, it's been difficult. Difficult doesn't bother me. Dangerous doesn't bother me. Uh, complex doesn't bother me. What bother, Hard work doesn't bother me. I, I actually enjoy all of that. What bothers me is being wrong, being foolish. So I try really hard not to, to be wrong or foolish. Uh, I am wrong occasionally. <laughs> try really hard not to be foolish. But as far as leaving the Republican Party, um, I believe that there are some outstanding, amazing, fine patriots who are members of the West Virginia Republican Party. And I believe that they are grading as I was against the incompetence, the arrogance, and the uh, unethical behavior of the current leadership of the West Virginia Republican Party. Um, I've spoken with a number of them, and I believe that they're doing the right thing by remaining members of the party and trying to change it from within. I personally, however, could not, after having been asked by the leadership to leave, being told that I was not a that I was not welcome in the party. I wasn't going to continue to inflict myself upon the party. And interestingly enough, something that I don't think anybody projected, that made it possible for me to execute this independent run for governor. Does that? Yes, ma'am. Does that, does that address your, your concern? Um, yes, sir. All right. So 
again, I think we have a, a topic that um, this, this Mr. Klein's been waiting to get to for a while, and I think it's it's a great one. Is that for, Dean Klein? Uh, let me find the – no, no, it wasn't Dean Klein. It was Clinton Klein. Okay. Um, let, me, let me pull his name up again. Um, well, here's one of them. He was wanting to get to it. So Second Amendment, um, where – where do you and I'll just point it, point out there that regarding the regarding Marshall switching to an independent, I didn't know him at that time, but I remember seeing it on social media where it, it definitely looked like somebody who was taking a stand, and it was a situation where he didn't necessarily leave the party; the party left him, sort of thing. But um, I appreciate that that answer. I'd never really heard the whole story like that before. Now on the Second Amendment. Um, I, I want I, I want to see this answer because I, I can just point out before he starts talking about the Second Amendment that he is far 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 and away the the best candidate you'll find in this race on on the Second Amendment. He's very very strong on the Second Amendment, and uh, we were just looking at guns and discussing guns uh, and the, the history of the Second Amendment and firearm ownership and development in this country here before we went uh, online in this video. So I think you'll really like him, Mr. Klein, on the Second Amendment, but I'll, I'll let him answer your question for himself. Thanks, John. So what's the specific question? Well, where do you stand on the Second Amendment okay. was his question, I believe. I okay. can't even find it now, but okay. that's what Easy it was. Enough. Easy enough. Um, anytime that I try to determine what I think, or where I stand on any particular issue, the first thing I want to know is what's the purpose that we're trying to accomplish. So based on that, I think it's very important that we establish the purpose of the Second Amendment. It is Dean Klein. Clinton it is Dean Klein. Klein. Yeah. Okay. So the purpose is not to allow you to hunt, although that's one of the benefits, you know, to hunt with guns. It is not even to allow you to defend yourself or your family, although that is absolutely a benefit and a right that you have. The Second Amendment is about individual citizens being prepared to protect themselves from an overweening, overreaching, and, and arrogant government. In other words, to uphold and defend their rights when the government refuses to. That's the purpose behind the Second Amendment. Given that, I will tell you that your, your rights that are guaranteed under the Second Amendment shall not be infringed. I'd like to go beyond that and say that uh, given the opportunity, I would I would welcome the opportunity to be a part of making West Virginia a Second Amendment um, um, sanctuary. sanctuary state. Thank you. A Second Amendment sanctuary state so that if the federal government ever imposes laws on the rest of the nation that infringe upon our Second Amendment rights, um, the state of West Virginia will simply opt out of those laws. We'll simply say, you know what, we're not going to enforce them here. Um, the Second Amendment is the amendment that secures all the other rights, all of our other let rights. Me, let, me, yes, let me add to the question. I'm going to go ahead and uh, add to the question here because just, I think it was yesterday, uh, Jim Justice, our current governor, um, put a, issued a Facebook post, or I guess you post a Facebook post, showing him in a gun shop somewhere, and he's looking at shotguns and Ironically, he's he's the only one in two of the pictures not wearing a mask, but but he's he's looking at shotguns and and I put a video up on my YouTube channel the other day of him teaching children. I don't know when this was a year ago or so about supposedly the Second Amendment. He's talking about his bird dog and he, he loves to go bird hunting. And here in this post yesterday, he's talking about how strong how he's supported by the NRA. And we have a strong tradition of hunting in West Virginia. So here's my question to you is, do you believe that, that Jim Justice misunderstands why we have a second amendment and what the second amendment is all about? And do you think that when our founding fathers wrote the second amendment, argued about it and ratified the second amendment, do you think that they had deer hunting or bird hunting in mind? Thanks, John. Um, I can't possibly say what Jim Justice is thinking. All I can say is what he said and what he indicated in that speech, in that, uh, that classroom experience was that he believes it's about hunting. 
Now, he may believe otherwise, but I'll tell you that what he said was it's about hunting. Let's, let's just put it in context. When the Second Amendment was written, it was written by people who had just fought a revolution, who had just led a bunch of amateur soldiers against the greatest professional army that the world had known to that point and licked them clean. I mean, just whipped them, sent them home with their tail between their legs. And they did it because the private citizens bore arms. I'm pretty sure they weren't thinking about duck hunting. They were thinking about building this nation, securing this nation, but more importantly, securing the individual natural rights of the citizens. And so the, the right of the individual citizens to bear arms and to protect their rights was written into our Constitution. And it was written there because that is the right that secures all the other rights. I will never, ever, ever, ever back down from the Constitution, the rights that are protected in it, and certainly never from the Second Amendment. I will take a bullet to the face before I back down from securing your individual natural rights to include, and especially, the Second Amendment. Okay, we've got a question from Katie, and she said that a lot of folks have asked, what will you do to help coal miners and their families? And I guess people are asking this on the website. Yeah. What will you do to help coal miners and their families? Coal-fired plants are talking about moving away from coal, and they're right. worried. You might want to repeat the question. I don't sure. know if they can hear me or not. Well, let's, let's put it over here okay. so you can read. All right. All right. So the question uh, from Katie um, is apparently a lot of people are asking on the website, what will you do to help coal miners and their families, coal-fired plants, they're talking about moving away from coal, and they're worried. In fact, we just heard Joe Biden state at the, at the uh, debate last night that he wants us to be um, not creating any more energy, what was it, by like 2023 or something. So, I mean, obviously that <clears throat> that's ridiculous, but right. it, the, the half of the entire Democrat Party, their official position at this point is apparently, because Joe Biden says he was the Democrat Party last night, I know you've been campaigning. You didn't get, get a chance to watch it. But he said, I am the Democrat Party. And then he said that we we don't want to produce any more energy by, that's our goal, by 2023 or whatever the case may be. So clearly, they've announced their intention to shut down the coal industry, to build no more coal-fired uh, power plants. And clearly, that's not going to go over well in West Virginia. Right. Not that he cares. So right. as far as West Virginia state politics... You know, Jim, Jim Justice obviously has interest in coal. So what's, what's your position on it? I mean, what do you say to the coal miners, their families, and other people that are in the coal industry? Well, first thing I'd like to make clear is that the age of fossil fuels is far from over. Uh, we will de be dependent upon fossil fuels for generations to come. Uh, that's not because I want it to be that way. It's just because a simple analysis of the valid information that we have available will make it very clear to anyone who's paying attention that uh, our society is dependent on fossil fuels. That's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, I'm not willing to uh, push our society backwards to uh, destroy the, the wealth that we've created, to, to lose any of the ground that we've gained by trying to shut down fossil fuels. So the first thing that I will do is I will try really hard to help President Trump win re-election. Because if the other guy wins it, obviously we're going to have a problem. And I don't mean just West Virginia coal miners. I mean all of us. Because I think we're all aware of the impact that the cost and the availability of, of fuel, of energy, has on everything. I mean, think about it. You, know, you want to talk about how much a tomato costs. How much does it cost to buy a tomato from the store? Well, part of what you got to factor in is the cost of running a vehicle to transport that tomato to the store. The cost of running the uh, generator that, that makes the lights in that, that store work and the air conditioning and the refrigeration. So, you know, the cost of fuel is bound up in everything. And uh, so we have to have reliable, uh, clean, and by clean, I mean processes that help us to, to burn fossil fuels in a clean way. So available, clean, and, and uh, reliable and, and inexpensive fuel. Otherwise, our society is, is going to be in a lot of trouble. Um, the next thing is, so first of all, I'm going to, I'm going to do all I can to help President Trump win re-election because the, the other option is unacceptable. The other thing is I would like to restructure our thought processes in the government and actually lead. Remember a while ago I was talking about 
uh, directorial authority versus personal authority or, or personal influence. I would use my personal influence to, uh, to gather all of the information necessary to restructure our, uh, our processes, our thought processes, our legislative processes to support not only the uh, not only the existing um, not only the existing fossil fuel programs that we have, such as coal, natural gas, fracking, that sort of thing, but actually to increase it and to build on it, such that we we are using the other methods of, of producing energy to include nuclear. I think that West Virginia could become a net exporter of energy. That would become a could become a, a key component of our, our economy, really build the economy of the state, provide for new jobs, new opportunities, new industries. I would also want for the those industries, especially say the extraction industries, such as the natural gas extraction, to build downstream production here. So we draw the gas and the petroleum distillates out of the ground. And instead of shipping them off somewhere, we actually use them here in building a manufacturing sector in West Virginia that will be vast. Now, I've already mentioned clean. You know, I, I love hanging out outside. I, you know, Julie and I, our, our idea of a good time is going hiking in the woods and going canoeing. And, and uh, that's that we have kayaks. You know, we like to we like to hang out on the rivers in the woods. I do not intend to poison our environment. My kids live here, too. But we have to develop. We have to. Uh, uh, build these industries that are absolutely dependent upon energy and the only reliable and efficient form of energy that we have that can actually power that sort of growth are fossil fuels. Now, given that, I understand that people say the age of coal is dead. Well, there are some people who know enough about coal to realize that there are special types of coal that are used for special purposes. I think we all understand that as we go forward into the future and we develop new technologies, those coals will still be necessary. Standard coal used for burning to produce energy in a power plant. Um, I think we need to reopen uh, or we need to open the option. I was going to say reopen the option, but uh, it's closed now. We need to open the options for building coal fired power plants. Um, we can do it. We can do it cleanly. We have the technology and we need to make sure that it's done cleanly, but it can be done. And then West Virginia can produce massive amounts of coal. Once again, the coal extracted here, burned here, the electricity produced here, and shipped out. Also, we are close enough. Uh, uh, we are close enough to ports that we can ship coal out to other countries. We've been doing it. Uh, we can continue to do it. Um, once again, I, I don't want to poison our environment. I'm not going to tell you, however, that you're ever going to see the heyday of Welch, West Virginia. Um, based on coal, again, but what we can do is, given this comprehensive package, we can diversify our portfolio of industries. We can build the economy in this state so Welch can once again have a heyday, just not based solely on coal, based on a number of industries. And if I may, I'd like to move beyond just the question about coal, and we're talking about what am I going to do for the coal mining families? Well, first of all, I'd like to not classify people by the type of work they do because people are individuals. What I'd like to do is open up the market and let you make your own choices. You don't have to be a coal mining family. You can have other opportunities. If you want to continue working in coal mining, I think there should be opportunities there. But what we need to do is we need to build our infrastructure. We need to have roads that actually work. And I'm not talking about specifically roads that are built uh, uh, to bring investment in from the outside, but simply you know, the, the roads that you use to get to church, to take your kids to school, to go to work. Those roads need to be rebuilt. We need safe infrastructure. But in, on top of that, we need communications infrastructure. And, and what we can't do is we can't play catch up. We can't try to catch up to where everybody is right now, because by the time we do that, we'll be five years behind everybody else. What we need to do is we need to leapfrog. We need to jump ahead and go ahead and aim for the next, the next level of communications infrastructure. And that will open up... Uh, that will open up educational, economic development opportunities that uh, we can't even imagine right now. We have smart, capable, entrepreneurial people here in West Virginia who can do amazing things if they're simply given the opportunity. We do not need for the Chinese to come in and buy half the state. We do not even need necessarily for other large industries to come in from other U.S. states and take over or to extract our resources and take them off somewhere else. 
what we need is we need to grow organically. Yeah, we can invite investors and businesses in from the outside, but they need to become part of West Virginia. They need to immigrate here and become part of who we are. But not only that, what we really need to do is we need to organically grow. We need locally owned businesses that we can grow here. It, that's the only way we'll have sustainable development is if it's organic to this area. It has to be us. It has to be West Virginians who make it happen. And in order to make that happen, it needs to become easier to start and maintain a small business because small businesses grow into larger businesses. You don't just start a large business. You have to start small. You have to build it. And we don't want to despise the day of small things. We want to, we want to, to recognize the potential there. So what we have to do is we have to make sure that as people, as West Virginians, uh, want to exercise their, their initiative and their innovation and start new businesses, start new ideas, maybe even start whole new industries here in West Virginia, we have to make it possible for them by, first of all, decreasing the hurdles they have to jump through to start a new business. Secondly, decreasing the amount of taxes they have to, uh, to pay. And, and, and also by decreasing the regulations that they, have to, uh, that they have to comply with. Now, once again, I am not saying that I want people to just dump garbage in the rivers. That's not what we're talking about here. What we're talking about is actually making sense with our regulation. You know, um, licensing in the state of West Virginia is insane. You have to be licensed to comb your own hair, almost. It's insane what you have to be licensed for here. We need to fix that. Uh, the protectionism in various professions and, and areas of work uh, needs to end. People just need to have the opportunity to work. And also, silly, strange, destructive taxes, such as the business inventory tax. I mean, do you realize that if you own a business and you, and you have to have inventory, you have to purchase the inventory from a supplier. And when you purchase that inventory, you pay sales tax on it, which is fine. Consumption tax, in my estimation, a sales tax, in other words, is the only valid form of taxation in my mind. So when you sell it, you also collect sales tax on it, right? So twice that item is, is received sales tax on it. Actually, it's it's been taxed a few more times. The raw materials were taxed. The production process was taxed. The transport was taxed. It's all being taxed. But let's just go ahead and start with this. So you're running a business. You have inventory. You purchase the inventory. You pay sales tax. You sell the inventory. You collect sales tax from, from the purchaser. Do you guys realize we actually have a tax in West Virginia on the inventory that's sitting on your shelves? It's just sitting there. It's not earning you any income. It's just sitting there and you're paying tax for the privilege of being allowed to have something sitting on your shelf. That has to end. It has to end. And every time that I bring this up, I hear somebody say, well, that's where the counties get their money, that and, and property tax. I understand the county governments need a little bit of money to operate. Um, it needs to be from a valid tax. An inventory tax is a completely invalid tax. And I am willing to work with these governments, these county and, and local governments, to make sure that they have the resources they need to function according to their valid charter, which is to uphold and defend the individual natural rights of their citizens. But this, this idea of, of taxing a business just for having inventory is destructive and counterproductive, and we will never build a functioning economy as long as we have taxes such as that. So I realize that I've branched out into a bunch of other things and I got a little wound up there, but uh, as far as the short answer, our friends and family and our neighbors who are, uh, you know, out of work or under underemployed because of uh, the destruction of the coal industry, um, what I would say is I think the, the coal industry can come back some. I don't think it's ever going to be like it was before just because we've developed new technologies and we've developed new processes. It's not going to be like it was before. It can come back, though, some. But we also need to develop other industries. And uh, we need to we need to recognize that we're never going to give up on fossil fuels. Um, it's, it's not we're not ready to do that. It's going to be a long time if that ever happens. I got so, another question yes, for you. Um, Ashley had a question some time ago that that um, we, we weren't able to get to, but I think I'll, it has to do with schools. And I think a lot of people have this question right now. And her question is, is I would love to hear. Marshall's thoughts on the special needs children that cannot attend school due to sensory issues and not being able to wear a mask. I'm in Greenbrier County and my daughter cannot attend school in person because she can't wear a mask. 
I think she would benefit more from being in school than doing remote learning. And I've heard, I've had other people call me with, with questions similar to this. Um, and, you know, where you know, we have this crazy system that the governor's come up with, with the, 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 the color codes and the, and he's also lumped private schools in, into remote learning, whether or not, whether they want it or not, even if they have only five students and they meet in a church, for instance. So I think this is a big issue right now and he's not letting you know, students play sports and he's, he's restricting freedoms. And this lady is upset because her, her kid cannot go to school at all based right. on what's going on right now. So Thank you. I'd be interested to hear, I think she would as well, like as far as your position on schools and especially in regards to what's going on right now. Thank you. Thank you for that question, Ashley. And uh, if I can, I'd like to take a second and thank the campaign team for setting up the website and setting up this opportunity and uh, allowing us to to hear from our friends out in the field who have questions and allowing us to respond to them. I'd like to thank John for setting up this particular opportunity. So um, first of all, in response to John's comment about private schools, the governor has no authority over private entities to include private citizens, private businesses, churches, or private schools. The governor has no authority to tell you what to do. The fact that he's doing so is unacceptable and unconstitutional. All right, given that, let's move on to the public schools. The public schools are, of course, a branch of the government, and the governor, therefore, has authority over them. Now, the breadth, scope, and depth of that, that, government, that, uh, that authority over them is being tested now, I believe. Uh, personally, I believe that uh, everything should be decentralized and all decision-making should be devolved to the lowest possible level. Uh, mainly because the people at that level are the ones who know what they're doing. So I believe that individual teachers should be responsible for their classroom and have authority over their classroom. I think that they should establish the standards in their classroom for behavior and uh, for, for uh, performance. And if those standards are not met, I believe that they should be able to take appropriate action. I do not believe that they should be um, second-guessed by their administration or certainly not by a group of people who sit in a big marble building in Charleston and have never been to their classroom. I believe that the individual professional educator has that authority and that responsibility. I believe that the educational, the, uh, the individual uh, administrators of those schools have authority over those schools, administration of those schools. I believe that the county boards of education uh, should have authority over how those schools are run. Uh, now they have to meet the standard. They have to meet the standard, but how they meet that standard is up to them because they know their families, they know their area, they know that uh, the issues they're dealing with far better than anybody else possibly can. And of course, the local county boards of education are accountable directly to the voters of that county. Who's the state board of education accountable to? Nobody. They're appointed by the governor. They're appointed for nine-year terms. Most of them were not appointed... Most of them were not appointed by the current sitting governor. Um, and, uh, you know, there's not really any any way to have them removed that I can see other than attempting an impeachment. But, um, you know, uh, that's I, I don't know how effective that would be. So really what you've got is a very small group of people who make decisions based upon their own priorities, their own leanings, their own understanding of the situation, which often is very lacking because they're not in your situation. They don't know. And uh, they're making all these decisions about how the individual teacher should manage a classroom. I completely disagree with that. Everything should be devolved down to the lowest level possible. Uh, whatever you have responsibility for, you should have authority over. Because responsibility and authority are two sides of the same coin. So having said that, and, and I really am getting to an answer, Ms. Ashman. Um, we are specifically concerned about kids going to school. Well, I think that's a local decision. I don't think the governor should have a color-coded chart and decide who's going to school and who's not. That's far too much power for one man to wield. Uh, he doesn't have the knowledge. He doesn't have the, uh, the reach to, to actually understand the issues that you're dealing with, and he should not be making those decisions. And I, as your governor, would absolutely refuse to make those decisions and ask the, you to make them instead, based on the best information we could give you and the best support we could give you. So beyond that, we're talking about special ed specifically. So that, that applies not just to the classroom, but to sports and all that other 
all the other activities that are involved with the schools should be handled by the County Board of Education who are elected by and directly responsible to the people of that county, whose kids go to that school, whose taxes support that school. Okay, beyond that, we're talking about special ed. Uh, I have a son who is in special ed. His name is Josiah. He is absolutely my favorite person on the planet, and sometimes I wish I could be more likely like him. Everybody who's ever met him thinks he's the greatest guy on the planet, and uh, he has some great teachers. Um, I, I have nothing unpleasant to say about any of his special ed teachers, and uh, they seem to really care about Joe, and um, I'm, I'm really grateful for them. Well, when the shutdown happened back in, in March, uh, Joe was very disappointed to leave school. He has a lot of friends at school. He loves his teachers. He loves what he does at school. And, and the interaction and the stimulation, the mental stimulation that he gets at school is critical to his development. And, of course, he is, you know, I mean, like all of us, there is a certain period of time during which you are most likely to develop most effectively. And uh, Joe needs the attention that, that uh, he gets from his special ed teachers. So the idea that some guy sitting in Charleston who has no idea who Joe is, how important his teachers are, or what the actual situation is in our community can make decisions or is allowed by other people who should stop him, uh, is allowed to make these decisions that affect my son so profoundly uh, is, it makes me angry, it makes me very angry. And I assume that you're probably angry too, and I don't blame you. So uh, first of all, it's critical to note that in West Virginia, the constitution of our state actually guarantees a free and efficient education to each school aid student in this state. Now, the opportunity for the education, the kid can choose not to receive it. But if we get to the, when, well, I was going to say if we get to the point, we have already gotten to the point where one man sitting in Charleston can decide to abrogate your child's constitutional right to a free and efficient education. Um, something needs to be done about that. And I've tried to do something about it. I've tried to do various things about it. I've tried to have the legislature call a special session. I've tried to have the governor call a special session. I have sued the governor in the uh, West Virginia Supreme Court of Appeals, and they refused to hear my, my suit. Uh, and now I'm running against him because somebody needs to indicate that this is wrong and demonstrate clearly that it's wrong for him to sit there and decide that your son's constitute or your child's constitutional rights uh, are meaningless. This state government exists to fulfill, to uphold and defend those rights. And by upholding your kid, your uh, your child's right to an education, or uh, refusing to uphold your child's right to an education, he is denying that right, and he is absolutely oppressing your child. This needs to end. Now, if on the other hand, excuse me, uh, I think you and I both know that uh, that education via computer works well with some students. Uh, my son. It's, it's helpful, it's useful, it's part of what he needs, but what he really needs is personal interaction, direct direct influence from an adult he loves and trusts. And he gets that at school. And he gets some of it at home. But what he needs is what he's promised by the Constitution of the state of West Virginia. And he was deprived of that. Um, so what I'm getting at is, first of all, the governor needs to establish the standard that we will uphold and uh, we will fulfill the Constitution constitutional requirements. Point number one. Secondly, he needs to ensure that the authority, not just the responsibility, but the authority for ensuring that we meet those requirements is devolved down to the lowest level. In this case, it would actually be to my son's individual teachers, to your child's individual teachers, and to the administration to back them up in their attempts to fulfill that, that uh, requirement. Now, I as a parent have a lot of responsibility as well, of course. I have to make sure that Joe is prepared to go to school, that he does the work that they assign to them, that uh, he has a good attitude, that he knows how to behave, um, that he he does what's required of him. That's, that's my part. And uh, we all need to do our part. But when we're talking about the government, denying your child the right that is guaranteed under the Constitution, that is absolutely a problem and it needs to be fixed. It needs to be fixed in such a way that it never, ever, ever happens again. I hope that's close to what you were looking for. Yeah. All right. um, Kathy Stacy asks, personal property taxes are too high. What do you think can be done to fix this? And I, there were a couple comments about personal property taxes. So okay. maybe address that. Sure. Okay. First of all, 
I'd like to say that I, I recognize once again that the counties depend on, on property taxes. Um, I think that's unfortunate and I'll explain why in just a minute, but uh, I think that we really need to give the counties and the local governments a little more leeway to figure out how to fund their activities while also holding them accountable to actually uphold and defend the individual natural rights of their citizens and to do nothing other than that, um, nothing beyond that rather. Um, given that, let's talk about property taxes and what they are and where they came from. So in my master's program, I did a lot of studies on the progressives that uh, pretty much started at the, at the end of the 19th century, the prog progress, quote, progressive philosophy and uh, became deeply rooted in the United States um, at the beginning of the 20th century. One of the things the progressive philosophers proposed was that the government should confiscate all real property and all durable property. And what that means is all real estate, land, buildings, all that sort of thing, farmland, whatever kind of land it is, all buildings, and then, you know, such as fa uh, 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 factories, your home, the government should own all of that. And then in addition to that, it should own all of your durable goods, such as your uh, your boats, your cars, your, you know, your machinery that you use to do your business. And the government should confiscate those and hold title to all of them and then rent them back to you. That was literally uh, proposed by the progressive philosophers at the beginning of the 20th century. Everyone said that's crazy. The American people will never allow that. The American people are independent, strong, and smart, and they will never allow you to take away what they've earned and what they've created. So what they did was they recouched it instead of the government owning everything to you own everything, but you have to pay rent on it anyway in the, in the, the guise of a tax, a property tax. Think about what we're saying here property tax. You are being taxed for the privilege of owning something that you have created or earned. Property tax is one of the most unethical, immoral methods of funding a government that there ever could possibly be. And what has happened is your property has literally been confiscated from you by the government and it is being rented back to you. That's exactly what's going on here. You think you own your home? You Well, you pay off your loan to the bank. You think you own it, right? You've got the title in your hand. Try not paying your property tax and see how much longer you hold that title. The government has an ongoing lien in perpetuity against your property, which will never, like I said, in perpetuity, it will never end. You can never pay this debt off. They own it. You don't. You're paying rent. Property taxes need to go away. They're completely unethical. Um, I had an interesting question here. Sorry, I missed it from Lawrence Smith. And I have no idea what your answer to this is. Uh, do you support or oppose making family law and abuse and neglect records and proceedings open to the public? Again, that's from Lawrence Smith. That is a tough question, and I don't think I can answer it effectively um, because I just don't know enough about it. But I can tell you that I think that there are aspects of it that must always remain private. I think that data, information about the cases, um, some aspects of that absolutely need to be public. We need to understand you know, how many children are in foster care. We need to understand uh, how many cases of neglect or abuse there are. Uh, we need to understand where those are happening, whether they're happening in, in Martinsburg or Charleston. Or, you know, there might be some some dynamic there that's that's necessary for us to address as a society. Um, but there are things, absolutely things about it that should be protected, such as the identity of a child who has been sexually abused. I mean, that child shouldn't bear that stigma for the rest of their life. Now, the identity of the abuser should become public knowledge, and they should suffer eternal shame and horror at what they've done. Um, and also they should <clears throat> be held accountable by the government. The government should uphold and defend that child's right, even though, even though it's after the fact, should uphold and defend that child's right by holding the abuser accountable. And um, I, I only think the abuser should be held accountable for as long as the child is dealing with the issues which result from that abuse, which would be pretty much for the rest of their lives. Um, 
As far as the records becoming public, I would have to have more specific information about what parts of the records you're talking about. But I hope that my general response that data, information about types of cases, maybe even specific information about a given case, as long as the identity of the, the innocent parties to that case can be protected. Um, I realize that's complex. I realize there are cases where that may or may not be possible, but uh, I think I would need a more specific question to answer more effectively. Uh, I hate to do this. I know it sounds like a politician ducking responsibility for an answer, but I, I, I can't answer more effectively without more information about what you're asking. Uh, I hope that's helpful. Yeah, I mean, that's a that's a tough question. I don't know exactly what my answer would be, would be to that either. Um, you know, it generally divorce and family loss, uh, you know, stuff is, is only available to, to the litigants, but there are ways to, to get those records, um, you know, when the, if, if the need be. So I don't know, there's lots of problems with the family court system with the, and with the abuse and neglect system. And I don't think the, availability of the records is at the top of the list because okay. if I know records exist, I can get them. I just got to get a court order to get them. But there are a lot of other problems dealing with ex parte orders um, and lack of due process rights that really that pervade that system. But I mean, that that's really the, the, uh, you know, the big thing that pops out in my mind is, is a lot of people are, are upset at, some of the injustices that happen involving kids and family court and the abuse and neglect system. And although there might be a records problem, but it, it, that's, that's far from the biggest problem in my opinion. Generally, I'd agree with what you just said. Um, and I think that I would go farther than that and say that the way that we're going to solve those issues is by dealing with the systemic. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Dealing with the systemic issues in the way that the government entities function rather than in knowing specific specifics about this, this family or that family. Um, knowing what happened with any individual family might be instructive, but I think that what we really need to know is um, how the system itself functions or is dysfunctional and how we can we help out with that. Um, I know that's, that's another, it sounds like another politician answer, but really what I would like to do is I would like to open up the systems and the processes of DHHR, um, the uh, foster care system, the adoption system, the courts, and make those available for critique by the people for whom, whom they serve and to the, uh, the legislators who are the people's representatives. I would like to open that system up, make it more transparent without necessarily exposing the families or the litigants to uh, any more no, to, to be any more scrutiny than they've already gone through with the courts. Mark Miller said, I hear freedom. <laughs> <laughs> freedom. <laughs> All right. So let me, let me just ask the last question here. So I, I know from my experience in being involved with political campaigns uh, when I was in college, getting a political science degree that one of the not so obvious things that you have to teach to somebody running for office, I'm sure somebody has told you this before, but it, I think comes, it's, uh, it's not something that would be obvious to most of us is that one of the, one of the most difficult things to do sometimes is to actually ask people to vote for you, you know, so that I know also from being a lawyer that you have to tell people what, you, what you want from them. And, you know, if I'm trying a case, I'm going to tell the jurors, look, what I want you to do is go into that room, pick a four person, go ahead and take a vote. If you all raise your hand, come back with a not guilty. It, it doesn't have to take more than four or five minutes. Right. And so I, I ask them specifically what I want them to do. And, and um, so let me just ask you one last question to kind of wrap this thing up here. And why don't you... You know, you're speaking to the, the jury online here, and hopefully we have thousands of people who watch this online before you know, the election. So as far as a, wrapping up this video, the last question, what is it that you want people to do on election day? Well, 
what I'd like for them to do right now is to go to our website, um, watch the videos there, read the information that's available, study the information, pray, and then be prepared to vote. And then on a and then but be between making that decision and election day, I'd like them to convince their friends to go to our website to watch the videos, to read the information available there, and to discuss it and to, and to pray and make a decision about voting. And then I want them to show up at the polls on election day. And when they get to the section on governor, go down and click the part that says write in, skip over where it says Jim Justice, skip over the other guy, go to the, the little uh, checkbox that says write in, and then type S, as in Stephen, dot Marshall, M-A-R-S-H-A-L-L, -L, Wilson, in that block. You'll be able to type it on the screen. There'll be a little touch screen that pops up. Looks like a keyboard and just S dot Marshall Wilson. And uh, I would be really grateful for that. And I tell you what, if you give me the opportunity, if you allow me the privilege of serving as your governor, I will do all that I can to restructure the executive branch of your government to serve you under the Constitution, to uphold and defend your individual natural rights, and in the process become such an effective and humble and, and, and uh, useful entity to you that it puts other entities such as the judiciary or the, or the legislative on the spot so that they have to revamp the way they function to be more effective and more customer focused like the, like the executive branch. And then I want you, the people, to understand this is how it should be and for you to never, ever, ever let it devolve from this, to never let it be anything less than a constitutional government serving you with, uh, with a, a service with a smile. I want you to never let that go away once we've established it. That's what I'm asking. Thank you, sir. Oh, and also, if you feel like it, you can send us a few bucks. I didn't inherit a billion dollars like that other guy did. And, uh, you know, we're doing the best we can, and we use every penny uh, to... Uh, we use every penny to, to, to focus on a strategic need. We don't just throw money away on silly things. So if you could, send a check to P.O. Box 29, Jarrodstown, West Virginia, 25420. P.O. Box 29, Jarrodstown, West Virginia, 25420. Or you can go on my Facebook page, and I've got a link there where you can donate online right at the top of the page. I would be profoundly grateful, and we will use it honorably and well and strategically. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, Marshall, for coming to Union, and uh, we hope to have you back soon. And thanks, uh, everybody who came to, to watch, and thank all of you online. If we didn't get to all your questions, um, maybe we can next time. I know that Marshall's team is watching, so uh, thank you very much uh, for, for – make sure that you write in S. Marshall Wilson. I put it up on the screen. If you have any questions, go to Marshall's website www.marshall4wv.com. And again, don't forget to watch that YouTube video of South Dakota's governor and understand, awesome. understand just how important this is, you know, what we could have had, but what we still could have. So thank you for watching. Until next time.